thank you very much for this invitation. I'm very, very happy to be here and also to have organized this great summit day for this visit. Um, we will speak uh, about uh, two uh, experiments uh, which uh, uh, are um, cosmic micro background experiments. So I'll uh, introduce uh, the science about uh, the cosmic micro background uh, in, uh, in the next uh, slide. the division of topics I'll introduce the cosmic micro background I speak about its polarization properties how to measure it and the boomerang and the larger scale polarization explorer experiments Silvia Masi will speak about the United knowledge effect how to measure it and the Olympo experiments and then the future of this activity with uh, the millimeter uh, Let's start uh, from the very basics. We live in an expanding universe uh, and uh, all distances uh, uh, increase with time. So uh, what uh, we uh, have as effects of this expansion is that uh, photons traveling in the universe uh, increase their wavelengths uh, as much by uh, the same factor as all other lengths in the universe. This results in a redshift of photons and in the upper law of uh, the um, expansion of uh, the universe. Um, so what uh, we see is that, uh, for example, a blue photon coming from a distant galaxy uh, travels uh, in an expanding universe uh, and uh, after uh, some time uh, will uh, increase its wavelength uh, and uh, when uh, we will uh, reach uh, our uh, galaxy uh, we will have uh, a much longer wavelength and uh, the longer the travel the longer the wavelength the larger the wavelength uh, increase so we measure this increase by the cosmological redshift, which is the ratio of the two wavelengths, uh, wavelength that uh, uh, when we receive the photons divided by wavelength uh, when the photon was emitted, which are the same ratio as the uh, scale factor of the universe uh, at the mission and uh, at uh, uh, detection. The other consequence uh, of this expansion of the universe is that the universe cools down. And uh, uh, so when we look far away in the universe, uh, we see back in time uh, earlier epochs uh, when the universe was older. And uh, uh, if we look far enough away, we will observe the epoch when the universe was uh, so hot that it was ionized. And this is uh, the other important, the other relevant uh, fact for our uh, observations. So it's like uh, looking at the surface of the sun. When uh, we look uh, to the sun, uh, this is a, a, a large image uh, of uh, solar radiation, and uh, <coughs> we see the solar photosphere, which is a hot plasma, and the photons uh, travel uh, eight minutes uh, and uh, reach uh, the Earth now. And uh, when we look uh, at the early universe, uh, we saw we look at plasma at plasma uh, at uh, similar temperature to the uh, solar photosphere. Light uh, travels uh, for 14 billion light years uh, and reaches uh, uh, our telescopes uh, here now. The difference is that in this uh, longer travel, the universe expanded by a factor of 1,000. So what was visible light becomes uh, microwaves, millimeter waves. So we need uh, to use uh, millimeter wave telescopes uh, to study the early universe. And, uh, 
So according to modern cosmology, the cosmic microwave background is the light which was present in the universe uh, was generated a few microseconds after the Big Bang and then uh, was uh, thermalized uh, in the plasma in the, the universe uh, for the first uh, 380,000 years uh, and then uh, was uh, released uh, when the, the universe uh, became uh, neutral and then was uh, redshifted uh, to produce uh, a black body spectrum uh, with a current temperature of about 3 Kelvin degrees. This is the measurement of the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background, notice uh, that the error bar are uh, 400 uh, sigmas, so otherwise would not be visible. Yeah. So this is an extremely precise measurement uh, demonstrating that uh, the early universe was uh, a, uh, in a thermal equilibrium and uh, um, from our point of view this means that uh, our observations uh, should be in the millimeter range, this is 2 millimeters, 1 millimeter, and 0.7 millimeters. So this is the range of frequencies we are interested in. And uh, this is the average spectrum. You look at the sky in any direction and you will measure this. Okay? Um, there are small fluctuations, and these fluctuations uh, are very small indeed and are interesting because uh, they uh, image uh, early structures which will evolve uh, finally in uh, larger scale structures in the universe today like uh, cluster of galaxies, galaxies and so on. So the observations show that uh, the cosmic microwave background has a perfect Planck spectrum and is uh, very accurately isotropic. Now, looking for anisotropy in this is very difficult because the anisotropy is very, very small. But uh, as when well, we look at the surface of the sun and we see oscillations, and from these oscillations we are able to infer the internal structure of the sun, in the same way, when we look at the cosmic micro at the ground, if we are able to detect these fluctuations, we can infer the earlier evolution of the universe from the measurement of these populations. For example, theory says that uh, to cool down from the Big Bang to about the 3000 Kelvin, to be cold enough to neutralize, the universe take, uh, takes uh, 380,000 years. This means that when we look back to the cosmic photosphere, okay, uh, and we look at regions which are separated by more than 380,000 light years, these regions have not been, are not in causal contact. There was not enough time during the previous evolution of the universe to exchange information forces uh, between the two regions are too far, there is not enough time. So this means that in the image of the early universe we expect to see a typical size, characteristic scale, which is the scale of causality. And this scale is 380,000. Within this scale, causal processes happen in the early plasma and uh, these processes are due to two forces. One is self-gravity and the other is pressure of photons. These photons are many, are about one billion photons for each baryon. So, uh, if you have uh, an overdensity in the early universe, uh, smaller than 380,000 light years. This overdensity will start to collapse under its own self-gravity, but uh, collapsing will increase its temperature and the photon pressure will increase. So at some point uh, the collapse will stop because uh, the photon pressure will be too high. And at this point uh, the perturbation will bounce back 
will expand, will cool down until the gravity wins again against the photon pressure. So we expect to set up oscillations in the density of other densities in the early universe. This happens as long as the universe is ionized. After that, the cross section between photons and matter decreases and uh, uh, a perturbation can start collapsing and the photon pressure will not prevent the collapse and so structures will start to form and will result they in galaxies, clusters of galaxies and so on. So observing the cosmic photosphere means to observe the effect of these two questions in the intensity of the primary plasma. And uh, there is a characteristic size of these perturbations between, uh, be because uh, the size of the horizon increases with time and uh, when a perturbation with a given size enters the horizon becomes smaller than the horizon, in fact it's the horizon becoming larger than the perturbation then we start to oscillate so the phase we have at the cosmic photosphere will be different depending on the size of the perturbation smaller perturbations will start oscillating earlier larger perturbations will start oscillating later and the largest ones will just have enough time to compress once before the universe neutralizes so the largest uh, spots we expect to see in the image of the cosmic microwave background should be about 380 light years in diameter. But also we expect to see smaller spots which have enough time to compress once and then to rarify once. And also to, have, uh, to see other spots which will compress, rarify, compress, rarify again. So if we plot the variance of the fluctuations versus the angular scale we expect to see peaks of variance corresponding to oscillations to fluctuations which oscillated enough to arrive to recombination with either compressed or rarified so a sequence of peaks in the power spectrum of the cosmic power spectrum so yes. what is the quality factor of this oscillation? Sorry? What is the quality factor of these oscillations? How many oscillations can could it take place for a small enough geometrical uh, uh, person? The, the, as many as you like. Uh, but the fact is that uh, for very small oscillations, very small fluctuations, uh, the uh, free streaming of uh, uh, photons uh, um, cancels uh, the fluctuation. So, in fact, what we see are six or seven peaks, and the other ones are suppressed on the life history. And uh, so, if we do this uh, calculation quantitatively, okay, we, you find uh, a power spectrum which is variance versus multiple, variance versus angular scale which has this uh, sequence of peaks and uh, the first peak is the largest one corresponding to the scale of the uh, causal horizon and then there are additional peaks which are suppressed by the stream to measure this uh, you need uh, experiments with uh, enough angular resolution and uh, how much is enough since uh, this peak is at a multiple of 200 the corresponding angular scale in a flat universe is 1 degree so if you have uh, an instrument resolution of uh, 20 arc minutes or 10 arc minutes you, are, you have uh, a, an instrument with enough resolution to measure the first peak and if you have a higher resolution you also measure the other peaks now how can we do this image? these are the general properties of the image how to measure it 
We need a millimeter wave telescope, as I said. And also, we have the problem of the Earth atmosphere, which is emissive at these frequencies and is not perfectly transparent. And this is mainly due to the uh, water vapor, which is the type of moment, so it interacts very efficiently with uh, millimeter wave photons. So, either the telescope operates from a very cold and dry site on the Earth's surface or operates uh, in the stratosphere or above the stratosphere. Otherwise, these measurements are not possible. So, here you see the brightness of the atmosphere compared to a 300 Kelvin black body for a typical high, high mountain site. And you see that the brightness is only a factor, uh, say, 50 less than the 300 Kelvin body. And we would like to see fluctuations which are very, very much smaller. So it's a big problem. If you go on a stratospheric balloon, uh, the brightness of the stratosphere decreases uh, because most of the water vapor is below 20 kilometers. The stratospheric balloon works at 40 kilometers. But still, there are ozone lines. Uh, and uh, you gain about the factor 1,000, which is uh, is, is a lot, but uh, is uh, still a difficult measure. So, uh, this is what we did with the boomerang experiment or, uh, about uh, 12 years ago now. Uh, boomerang was a stratospheric balloon payload with a 1 meter telescope, a cryogenic detector uh, of millimeter waves, and an attitude control system connecting the payload to the stratospheric balloon. And uh, you, here you see the primary mirror of the telescope is an off-axis telescope of 1.3 meters in diameter to have an angular resolution of the order of 10 half minutes at 150 gigahertz. And uh, the cryostat was a helium cryostat made of several uh, layers, as you know, and uh, this was able to cool down at the 0.3 Kelvin uh, all the uh, detectors for the 15 days of the stratospheric balloon mission. I'm not going into details of this, uh, but uh, the uh, refrigerator was a helium key refrigerator uh, with uh, a 34 STP liters of helium. Uh, and these are the detectors we used. Uh, these detectors are a, a small spider web of uh, uh, silicon nitride metallized. Uh, when photons arrive, they heat up the web, they are absorbed in the web, and they heat up the web and the thermistor, which is placed here. This same technology has been uh, quantified with boomerang and then has been uh, uh, used in other balloon flights and finally. Uh, on the, the Planck uh, high frequency instrument. Planck was launched uh, two years ago and has uh, recently finished uh, its activity. Um, here you see a few pictures of the mission. This is uh, the payload assembled and ready for the uh, flight. This is uh, the balloon, 800,000 cubic meters of helium, uh, lifting this payload uh, up to uh, 40 kilometers. 37 kilometers of And uh, here we see a few phases of the uh, launch. This happened in Antarctica because uh, uh, flying over Antarctica first of all you don't need uh, any uh, permission from uh, uh, populated countries. And also uh, the, the flight can be two weeks and uh, stratospheric uh, uh, wind jets uh, will uh, circumnavigate the South Pole coming back near to the launch site, hopefully. We have been lucky and the experiment actually came back, so we called it the boomerang, we are hoping exactly that. During the observations, the payload made the scans of the sky with a, a, through a pivot which allowed the payload to rotate below the balloon and uh, um, from these scans uh, we were able to build a map of the sky inverting 
this uh, system, which is a larger system. We have uh, a, a, the time order data, which is uh, 57 million samples, and uh, we have uh, uh, this data can be combined to measure the uh, signal in each pixel, and each pixel is uh, we have about 100,000 pixels, so we have to invert the system which is uh, um, uh, 57 million equations uh, with uh, 100,000 uh, nodes. This is formally the problem. Now, there are good methods to do this inversion, and this is a well-behaved uh, system. And after you do this analysis, what you get is this map of the cosmic microwave. So what uh, are we seeing here? We are seeing uh, uh, small fluctuations of the brightness of the cosmic microwave ground, and these small fluctuations are um, about uh, uh, 100 parts per million in size. And uh, the angular size, the typical angular size of this fluctuation is about uh, 1 degree. These are uh, uh, Having measured them at three wavelengths, uh, we are able to uh, see if the spectrum is the spectrum of the cosmic microwave ground or it is a container. And in fact, it is uh, the spectrum of the cosmic microwave ground. Uh, so, this is a good test for uh, the presence of uh, possible foregrounds, containing So, this was published, uh, and we, we did our uh, uh, angular power spectrum analysis uh, and we sh have shown that, that there is indeed a peak in the power spectrum at an angular scale of uh, 1 degree. Now 1 degree is exactly what you expect uh, in a uh, Euclidean geometry universe. If the geometry is Euclidean, the horizon, so the typical scale on the cosmic microwave ground is 380,000 light years. The distance is about 14 billion light years. If you take this ratio, you multiply by 1,000 because of the expansion of the universe, you find one degree. So uh, the fact that our spots have one degree in size uh, is a demonstration of the Euclidean geometry of the universe. Would the universe be uh, Card, we will see either larger or smaller spots. <laughs> so, in addition to the first peak, we also saw with moment and evidence for two other peaks which were identified and placed in the range of peaks. And after Boomerang, many other experiments were done to confirm these results. And the WMAP made the wonderful full sky maps of the cosmic microwave ground, but Boomerang just saw 2% of the sky. But they were very consistent in the region overlapping. And the WMAP produced the wonderful high signal to noise spectrum in several releases. Now, this is a five years release, and you see that this signal. Element. And using the larger telescopes uh, with the higher angular resolution from either the south pole of the Atacama Desert, uh, it was possible to measure uh, all the other peaks uh, in the spectrum of the cosmic microwave ground. And now we see one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven, maybe eight peaks. So this theory of uh, acoustic oscillations in the early plasma is confirmed. And uh, this sequence of peaks uh, can be uh, interpreted in terms of cosmological parameters uh, showing that uh, most uh, of the universe is, of the energy in the universe is made of a dark component which you don't really know what it is, but is something which does not mute the energy with the expansion. And 22% uh, is dark matter, which is uh, matter not uh, electromagnetically interacting, and only 4% is uh, normal matter. Uh, if you are able to measure this spectrum with uh, high enough sensitivity, you can see the effects of other, many other things. For example, the effect of massive neutrinos uh, is to shift uh, the spectrum 
as a seen here. And you say this is a very small effect. In fact, it is very small. And at that moment, uh, we, from this, uh, we have only an upper limit for the neutrino mass. Uh, but uh, if we are able to do much better measurements, we could be able to estimate the neutrino mass from these measurements. Now, what is generating the fluctuations? Uh, the current model is that quantum fluctuations in the very early universe are boosted to cosmological scales by an inflation process. And this inflation process is something I don't understand because I'm an experimentalist, but uh, uh, it's something related uh, to phase transitions in the early universe. There are, uh, it's, a, it's a predictive theory. The predictions are that uh, the quantum fluctuations are converted into Gaussian adiabatic density fluctuations and that uh, these fluctuations have uh, a flat power spectrum and uh, that uh, the geometry of the universe is Euclidean because if there is a huge expansion of the, ge of the universe then any initial curvature will be flat like expansion so, as I said before, the measurements of the acoustic horizons uh, uh, demonstrated the, the Euclidean geometry of the universe. If you take uh, a histogram of the temperature fluctuations, you do find that it is Gaussian, and this is the only range in the electromagnetic spectrum where the histogram of the sky is Gaussian. If you take the histogram of the visible image of the sky, it's not Gaussian. If you take the image of the infrared sky, the distribution is not Gaussian. The radio distribution is not Gaussian. Only the cosmic micro background is Gaussian. Uh, how can we test this uh, inflation? There is one additional uh, uh, prediction of inflation uh, is that uh, also tensor perturbations are generated in addition to scalar perturbations. This means uh, gravitational waves generated in the very early universe by the inflation process. Now, the first uh, three predictions of inflation have been verified by cosmic microwave counter experiments, uh, measuring the spectrum. To test the fourth, uh, we can use cosmic microwave ground observations, but we need to measure polarization. Why polarization? Because imagine that this is an electron at the cosmic photosphere, and that this electron will receive photons from the surroundings, and these photons are scattered by other electrons, and that if there is a quadrupole um, anisotropy in the distribution of the scatterers, then this electron will receive more radiation from this direction and less radiation from this direction. As a consequence, it will oscillate preferentially in this direction and less in this other direction. So it will scatter polarized radiation. So if you have a quadruple anisotropy in the rest frame of this electron. Now, how do this anisotropy? How is it produced? Imagine this is a, a hot and dense, uh, hotter and denser spot in the universe. There will be a convergent flux of electrons uh, attracted by the open density. So an electron here will be part of this uh, velocity flux. And if you stay in the rest frame of this electron, it will see surrounding matter coming towards him and uh, in this direction and uh, receding from him in the other direction. So what we see will be a quadruple anisotropy. And uh, if you look uh, for uh, electrons all around, uh, this will produce uh, a radial pattern of uh, polarization around a hot spot. You can do the same kind of argument with a cold and anders dense spot, and you will find a tangential pattern of polarization around this spot. So what we have concluded is that the velocity and density fluctuations will produce non-rotational patterns of polarization. 
while gravitational waves would produce a quadrupolar anisotropy with a rotor. So there is a way to distinguish between polarization produced by uh, density fluctuations and polarization produced by tensor fluctuations. And we can uh, do these measurements and uh, find with how much is the density related fluctuations, how much is the uh, tensor related fluctuations. So in principle, we can analyze the polarization of the cosmic fiber background and relate it to tensor fluctuations. And this would be easier than trying to measure the gravitational waves and the fluctuation because these waves have huge wavelengths, so we cannot measure it directly. The other problem is that this signal is extremely weak. And so we don't even know how small it is because there are not uh, uh, reliable predictions for the tensor fluctuations, but we can try to measure it. And so uh, WMAP, for example, has uh, detected the irrotational part of the polarization. If you take uh, all the cold spots in the WMAP data and you co the polarization patterns around the cold spots, you do find a tangential pattern of polarization around the cold spots. And you do find also a radial, it's not uh, so evident, but uh, you see it, a radial pattern around a hot spot. Now, the size of the effect is uh, <coughs> only a few micrograms, so it's very small. And the tensor part is even smaller, so it will be very difficult to measure. This is uh, the status of the measurements, uh, and you see there are measurements of the EE, which means uh, the uh, density related part, but we have only upper limits uh, for the tensor part. So measuring it will be very difficult, but uh, the price would be to measure processes happening in the very, very early universe. Now, how can we improve the measurements? Uh, first of all, our galaxy produces the polarized radiation at many different times. And this is a problem, because uh, this is, we, we measure the total and we have to know the mission of our galaxy to subtract. And uh, there are uh, sweet uh, spots of the sky where the emission of the interstellar medium in our galaxy is low enough. And uh, we can do good anisotropy measurements and probably good polarization measurements. So this has been uh, tried. Uh, and the Planck, uh, the Planck satellite, is also doing uh, polarization measurements. Uh, and uh, I, I don't have time to speak in detail about Planck, but I want to, want sh to show that this satellite uh, has uh, a frequency coverage from 25 to 950 gigahertz. Uh, so it's measuring the sky in a very wide frequency range. Uh, so that uh, local fluctuations, uh, which have a spectrum which is completely different uh, from uh, the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background, can be distinguished. And we can remove uh, very well the local fluctuations because their spectrum is different. And uh, here are the details of the polometers. Again, these are uh, spider web uh, or polarization size of the polometers, like the ones uh, we have used in Boomerang. Then there are radiometers. Here is a view of the telescope with the, the uh, primary mirror here, the secondary mirror here, and the focal plane here. And this is working from the L2 point of the Lagrangian point number 2 of the Sun Earth system, so 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth. The system has produced already maps of the sky. And from these maps, it's possible to separate the 
sea and B component, which is shown in red and yellow, from the local component, which is shown in uh, uh, white and blue. And this is the first time it's possible to do this separation very efficiently. This is a simulation of what we will be able to take out of the plant data in one year or so. And uh, to show how effective the plant is in separating different contaminations, uh, we notice that uh, in the different uh, frequency bands of the plant, uh, we have uh, contamination from uh, carbon monoxide. Okay? But uh, since uh, we know our response uh, to the different uh, frequencies, we are able to, to find uh, the master of uh, CO out of the plant data. So, you understand it is a long process, we have to find all the contaminants which are interstellar dust, free emission of CO, and so on. We have to subtract them, and then we will be able to give a very good amount of the volume of the After Planck, there are many experiments trying to measure semi-polarization. IBEX is an experiment based on volumeters and uh, uh, with many volumeters, 1000, SPIDER is another experiment made to measure simple polarization with volumeters with the larger angular scales and uh, in our lab we are uh, in collaboration with our colleagues here and Yuri Kuzmin and others we are producing a new flight, uh, preparing a new flight of boomerang with uh, using uh, uh, cold electron bronchers and this uh, is a key technology because this technology allows uh, to be insensitive to cosmic rays which is very important at, uh, at, uh, in the stratosphere and also uh, these bolometers uh, um, can be produced in larger rays so this was the old boomerang, the new one focal plane will have 90 bolometers, 93 polarization cells in the CEB at 340 gigahertz to monitor interstellar dust polarization plus 9 volumeters to measure the microbe ground. I'm not going to the details because the unit knows very well, I'm not an expert, but I can tell you it's a very smart idea. So, what can we do? Uh, fly against boomerang with this uh, uh, Volumeters, maybe adding uh, a halfway plate uh, to modulate polarization, uh, and we have some experience with this. And uh, also, we are preparing uh, a larger scale experiment, uh, which uh, is uh, an experiment devoted to is a spinning experiment, so the, the experiment spins continuously under the balloon to cover a larger fraction of the sky. And the experiment includes two cryostats, one for short wavelengths, 90, 145, and 130 GHz, with resolution around 2 degrees, and another one with coherent uh, radiometers. And, uh, we plan to fly this experiment from the Svalbard Islands during the polar night, so we will not have disturbance from the sun during the two weeks of the mission. Uh, at this point, uh, the, the, I just want to say that uh, these detectors uh, will collect the radiation from a very large area. So we will not uh, use uh, a huge number of detectors. We will use uh, maybe 100 detectors, each detecting many modes uh, of uh, the radiation, so that uh, we can uh, have uh, a very high sensitivity to large angular scales. Well, at this point, uh, I leave uh, the, uh, to Silvia to continue on the measurements of the uh, and uh, maybe uh, somebody have questions for oh, yes. Paula? Sure. If any. Please. Okay.
dobbiamo fare un solo, 